So I saw some stats recently regarding physical activity and mental health. So obviously the recommended guidelines by the government for moderate intensity activity um, is 150 minutes a week. So I saw a stat recently that only a quarter of people in the UK are achieving that. Um, the alternative option to moderate intensity is vigorous intensity exercise, uh, which is 75 minutes per week. And I saw another stat where basically only a third of people in the UK have made time to do vigorous intensity physical activity in the last year. And then in addition to that, 28% of people have said that their mental health has declined in the last year. So it feels like there's a bit of a correlation between people not moving as much as they probably should and obviously declining mental health or emotional well-being. Mm -hmm. What do you reckon about that? Well, what do they, what's the, what's the definition of moderate exercise so people know? Yeah. So moderate intensity exercise is, I think if you Google it, it says uh, it's basically breaking a sweat, yeah. but being able to hold a conversation. Right. But, okay. But you couldn't sing the lyrics to your favorite song. Not that I could sing them anyway, <laughs> but that's the definition. Whereas vigorous intensity exercise is basically sort of sweating a bit faster and, um, probably only be able to say a few words without having to stop the breath yeah because that's what i'd like to start with because people have different ideas of what moderate and vigorous are you know depending on their fitness levels age weight and all sorts of things so those statistics are always like people listen to them and they think sometimes they're they're either really good or really bad or whatever because they interpret it on what they feel yeah and i think uh, it's it's one of those things where it can it can be a really good thing and a really bad thing at the same time mm-hmm so with the with those statistics what it's, it's where to start with it yeah. you know where to start with it so 33 percent of moderate people do a moderate exercise um only a quarter so right. around 20 i think it's like 26 percent of people are achieving the recommended 150 minutes per week so like 30 minutes a day over five days or 21 minutes across seven days that is shocking. And if you think about the types of activity that you can do to achieve moderate intensity, we're talking about a brisk walk. You know, we're not talking about necessarily going into the gym. It's people just literally walking and moving to a point where they maybe get a bit of a sweat. Um, so if you're late for a bus and you get that little like, waddle on where you don't quite want to run, but you want to get the bus, that's kind of the pace. I mean, probably not even that, but somewhere around there. So that's it. Um, so and why, why are people not getting that though? It's fucking society, isn't it? It's lifestyle. Yeah, I think so. Um, there was another stat that I saw as well. I can't remember the exact percentage, but it actually showed that younger people, so it's not just like an older person thing, but 16 to 24 year olds, um, it was around 26%, I think, of them, um, don't didn't realize that act- activity improves like your mental health. So I think it's potentially people not prioritizing it because they don't realize that actually being physically active does benefit not just your mental, but your physical health and reduces your risk of long-term health conditions as well. I think being physically and mentally fit is the most important thing. You know, money, cars, everything all comes and goes. I say this to my clients all the time when they, you know, I've got a lot of successful clients who, who do really well, but their, their bodies are like shit and they, they don't ever prioritize themselves. And then they wonder why they've got high blood pressure and why they feel bad and why they can't get out of bed, why they've got bad knees, why they've got this and that. And I think it's just people have to have that mental shift of of not worrying about how much money you're earning, worrying about actually your body and your physical, physical self, because then that goes into your mental health, doesn't it? You know? Yeah, 100%. And I think in the same, in the same uh, study, which... It kind of surveyed thousands of people. So it was quite a large study. Uh, I think 58% of people said that the reason or the biggest barrier to them actually doing exercise is motivation. And again, maybe it comes back to the understanding thing, but people just don't feel motivated. And it kind of comes back to what you just said, where actually I think people just don't, yeah, they, they put other things, you know, maybe material possessions, career, you know, in front of actually doing physical activity. I think I think in general, life, health, and fitness it all interlinks. Because if you're struggling at work, struggling with money, money is a big factor. I find up with a lot of people, money is a huge factor of why they feel down, depressed, and then they they lose all motivation then to get in shape. And it's like this horrible cycle that they seem to go through. They seem to go through these cycles and cycles and cycles that they'll 
they'll, they'll struggle at work or they'll struggle financially or struggle with their partners. And then that knocks on to them not wanting to go to the gym because they don't, they just don't feel like it. They're like, oh, I've got all this stress in my life. I just don't want to do that. And then that, then they put on weight. And then when they put on weight, they're like, you know, I feel like shit now. And then they get into this spiral. It's always a spiral I see with people and it's, and it's super motivated maybe at the start when they start anything and then something happens in their life. Boom, goes downhill, goes downhill. And then before they know it, they're two stone heavier, they're depressed and they're just like, well, I can't see a way out of this. Sometimes it gets even worse. They're four stone, five stone heavier, you know, and they're like, how have I got into this situation? You know, it's been two years out of the gym and then it feels like a mountain to climb. You know, it's not just losing half a stone and cleaning your diet up at that point. It's like, fuck, I have to change my whole lifestyle. Uh, that that there is the biggest obstacle for me is that it's, it's that work-life balance and tr trying to separate your emotions from what you what 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 you need to do and what you have to do you know what i mean so you have to you have to separate those emotions for me like if you have to go to the gym to lose weight if something bad at work happens it still doesn't matter you still got to go to the gym and you lose weight that's the biggest barrier that i find people yeah i think like on that i think it's funny because I, i've said before that like movements like a net positive and what i mean by that is if you don't have the energy to move but you move anyway, you'll get more energy in return of moving than you need to put in to move. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you are struggling in other aspects of your life, so whether it's at work and being productive, actually being physically active will make you more productive, will give you more energy. And, you know, it, we can talk about the gym and, and everything else. And, you know, if people are in the gym space already, then, you know, just make a commitment to get in there on a regular basis and, and, and do that because often just get in there is the hardest thing. But once you're there, typically you don't have a bad workout. But if people aren't in the gym space, then again, just coming back to even the walking thing, you know, just yeah, going out just and walking. Out. Yeah. And and just any sort of physical activity is, is great. But again, trying to achieve a slightly higher intensity where it's like considered moderate, you know, some of the things that happen in the body, you know, really kind of change and lift your mood as well. So you've obviously got like chemicals in the body like um, endorphins which, uh, you know, we've probably all experienced if we've done some physical activity, it, it makes us feel great. Um, so that can lift your mood. Uh, neurotransmitters as well, so things like dopamine um, and serotonin. So they're, you know, on, on paper, you know, they do literally reduce like low mood, depression, anxiety. So you can actually start hacking your body to actually improve your mind by being physically active. You're right, mate. You're right. It, if people are more active, they will feel better. There's no two ways about it. But it's it's that initial kick, that initial motivation. And what I find a lot of people do is they let it get so bad that it's it's not too, it's never too late. It's never too late. But then they always feel like there's a mountain to climb. And what I would say to anyone listening that's even put on a little bit of weight and they're in that slump and they're feeling like, I need to get back to the gym, but I'll do it next month. Because that next month becomes next month, next month. And it becomes a year. So... Just, just go back, find an hour a day. You know, it doesn't even have to be an hour a day. You know, it could be half an hour a start day. Start with be, five minutes. Yeah, yeah, start just, with just, five minutes. Just get out and do yeah. something, isn't it? It's, uh, it's just that movement. It's just getting out, yeah. you know, again, Apple Watch, get get some sort of fitness tracker, start counting your steps. I say it to all my clients, it's like pillars. It's fundamental pillars that you've got to work towards, you know, and we talk about this all the time, don't we, with pillars and there's, there's certain aspects of your fitness journey in, in your life that I think are non-negotiables and I think steps get your steps in you know aim for if you were in a sedentary job and you're only getting 2,000 steps in a day fuck a 10,000 let's just get five let's just double that to get to five then work to seven and then work on to that to get to 10 you know but I think it's like some fundamental pillars that you need in your life like again hydration how important is hydration you know we're talking about motivation how much better do you feel when you're hydrated you know, it does so much for you. You feel so much better. You, you, you're clearer. You, you just, it's, it's those pillars that people miss and they just, they just need to put in place at times, those fundamental pillars where they can be like, right, this is what I'm going to do every day. Non-negotiables, I call them. Non-negotiables. I say it with my clients all the time. So there's, and they're only basic things. It's not things that are going to radically change your life. You know, you don't, at times you haven't got to like overhaul your diet massively and you haven't got to change loads of stuff. All you've got to do is change certain aspects, which will improve your life tenfold. And then when you have improved your life tenfold, you're going to be more motivated then to go out for longer walks, 
you'll see a bit of weight coming off. You'll feel a little bit better. Your fucking sex life might improve. <laughs> Everything around it might just get a little bit better. And then you might find the motivation to actually go into a gym and then find a fitness coach or you just fucking get on a treadmill and walk or go on a cross trainer and do this. And some people feel a bit lost when they go into the gym and they're like, oh, I don't really know what to do. Just jump on a bit of cardio kit. Just start, just get on something, see a stepper, see a fucking TRX machine, anything, a rower, something that you've used before and just get on it and just fucking go. Once you're knackered, leave. <laughs> just start. Mm. Yeah, it's very true, mate. And I think you, you touched on that motivation there and it, it, we should probably speak about that because it's one thing I think that people often have a misperception about. Um, they always think that motivation will just arrive at the door one day. So that they're sat there, they don't want to do anything and they're just waiting for, for this magic motivation to appear in their life and, and suddenly up and they're away. But we know that doesn't really exist. And, you know, if you wait for that, you'll be waiting forever. So I think sometimes, like you say, you've got to start maybe sort of committing to small little behaviours, um, you know, and these can be very basic little things. And over time, when you start seeing, like you start feeling different, you start looking different, you start getting some return on your investment, then you get motivated because now you can kind of see what you're getting for that effort. And I think once that happens, that the motivation that then appears and that will then maintain a level of consistency. Another thing you mentioned as well is about obviously people being busy at work these days and not doing any steps. And I find this a lot. And, and I'm guilty of it as well. Certainly like in a lot of today's, you know, way of working, we're on computers, we're sat at desks, we're hybrid working. Uh, so we're working from home now. So a lot of people since the pandemic more so aren't even doing a commute. And I think there's, there's a couple of things like with a commute because it's when I've commuted, massive pain in the ass. Like it's, you know, it's a waste of, you know, 30 minutes, an hour, two hours for some people, even more. And initially when I started hybrid work, and I was like, this is great. Like I don't have to commute anymore. But a couple of things I've noticed since have happened. Firstly, the, the lines between work and personal life have blurred a lot. So, so often I'll work longer hours because I'm not like, you know, shutting the laptop, I'm not leaving the office, I'm not yeah. going home. So sometimes it just like blurs the lines. But the other thing as well is, is first of all, when people commute, there's a bit of movement there. Like, you know, even if it's walking to their car, but, you know, in some bigger cities like London where people will be getting the tube. So and about all day. Yeah. yeah. So you're on the go. So suddenly you've potentially got, you know, maybe 20, 30 minutes in the morning and in the evening where you're actually doing some steps. Do you know what? How powerful steps are? I went, um, I went to New York last year mm. and I thought I'm going to see a lot of fat, fat people just, just because it's in America and you hear it. No one. No. Because everyone in New York, what are they doing? There's no cars. Well, there's obviously cars, taxis, but yeah. everyone everyone walks, uses a tube, commute yeah. in. And, you know, and it's exactly that. Yeah, London's Just similar. Move. So I think, you know, that commute is lost a little bit because you, you certainly aren't doing that physical activity now. And I think the other thing, and this is something that I think people probably didn't value, um, and hopefully this maybe resonates with a few people, but it was quite time to process your thoughts. So from like a mental health perspective, when you're like going from one thing to another and you're all on the go all the time, you're on your phone, you know, you're always distracted. So you never like, you never have mindfulness. So you can never just process and allow your mind to wander and think about your day, think about your worries, think about your anxieties and process and plan and solve problems in your head. Whereas when you would commute, you would have 30 minutes, maybe in the morning to think about your day, 30 minutes on the way home. So not only are you getting that physical activity, you're also getting that that mindfulness time as well. So what I recommend to people is a fake commute. I think this is a really good idea. It was uh, something I stole off a colleague actually, so I can't completely take it as my idea. But it's this idea that if you're hybrid working, before you start your day, leave the house, go for a, a 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 minute walk around the block, around the park, wherever you are. Um, and then you come back, you start your day. Mm. You hit five o'clock, close your laptop, leave the house, Do go for a walk. And you have a little ponder, you think about your day, you think about your evening. And I think if people did something like that, that would improve their physical activity through movement and also the mental well-being through movement, but also through having some mindfulness. That's, yeah, that's a really good idea because again, just dealing with people that are really sedentary, they sometimes they get 2000 steps a day. I was working out a little while ago when I was doing the high steps, I was trying to get between like 15 and 20,000 steps a day. 
if you if you can get if you can get up to fifteen thousand steps a day, it's about seven hundred calories a day you'll burn. Mm. You think of that over a week, over a month. Those extra calories, two thousand to fifteen thousand. That's like every day. You you don't people talk about uh, getting to the gym and doing loads of calories and and burning loads of. You don't even need to. If you're doing seven hundred calories of <laughs> in walking a day, that will add up so much over a month, over a year. You know that's the difference. That's the difference. You don't even need to kill yourself in the gym. Yeah. You just need that that fundamental discipline of being like, right, yeah. I want to hit 10,000 steps. I'm going to go out for an hour. And it is time consuming. But again, it's like what you said. You have a bit of time to think. If you don't want time to think, put on a, put on a headset, listen to a fucking podcast, listen to an audio book, listen to something that's fight for you. I used to really enjoy running in lockdown. Lockdown taught me a lot about just just mindfulness. And I would... I was a um, I was a footballer, but I was never a never a good runner. I never liked running. I hated it. But when I was in lockdown, there was not much else to do. So I used to go out five k's, ten k's all the time, every day, virtually. But one thing I I loved it towards the end because I was just thinking, thinking about what I'm going to do and how I'm going to plan stuff and all the different things that I want to do. Because you have that time to yourself to think. And there's so much now. Like I'm I'm I've talked about it many times. How much of a nightmare like my phone is for me now. And how much work I'm doing and all these different things. But if you take that time out and you do do a nice walk or some something similar, you know, something if it's swimming or whatever your like thing that you like to do, where you can just have a bit of time, no one with you, walk, chill, and at the same time, you will lose or you will lose weight doing it. You yeah. will feel better doing it. Yeah, and I think that's the thing. I think obviously we're talking, you know, about the sort of benefits of physical activity on mental health, but you know, weight loss is definitely a factor because I know personally, you know, if I look good, I feel good. I don't know a person who's in shape that doesn't, who feels better when they're out of shape. Yeah. There's not a person in no. the world ever, you know, and they can argue that to the fucking, they're blue in the face, mm. but I don't fucking believe them. There's no way that you will feel better being fat than you are with abs as a bloke. Yeah. Or, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's true. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, if you, yeah, typically if you're more confident, then you'll perform better in work. You'll, you know, maybe be still more comfortable with the people around you. So it definitely has a benefit as well. Um, Let's talk about the community as well, because I think this is like something that's massively undervalued, I think, when you think about activity. So we've talked about obviously walking and, and finding solitude to process thoughts. So that's, you know, one thing. Um, we obviously do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. We've played football. Um, you know, we go to the gym. And, you know, with that, you know, there's obviously the physical endeavour. You know, there's there is a degree of mindfulness around it because when you're going through that that sort of physical output, you you kind of are typically in that moment and thinking about that, or you know, sort of free of other thought, and you can process ideas. But what we find a lot, especially with jujitsu, is obviously community, and you get this with running clubs um, and and other sport clubs as well. But you suddenly get yourself around like minded people, and you kind of share in like you know, you go through that physicality together, and you you, you form a, a camaraderie as a result. How important do you think community is for people? I, th I think it depends on your situation. I think it depends on your situation, but there's a lot of people out there that, you know, do get intimidated going to a gym and they do, they do worry about that type of stuff, but everyone's there for the same reason and you meet such amazing people and you meet like-minded people. That's one thing I would say. You're not going to meet someone who's in the gym every day, every day working hard and, and then, and then not have something in common with them if if that's what you want to do as well. You know, straight away it's like, oh, what are you doing today? What what sets you doing? What you're training like? What's you eating like? You know, all those different things, and you learn a lot just from the people around you. And on top of that, if you do something like, like you said jujitsu or CrossFit or some you know, high rocks now, even running, mate, just run a running, club. running club, mate, great, you're great. Yeah, you you're with like minded people that are positive a lot of the time because. They're looking after themselves. They're doing something positive for their life. If you're around people that are very negative, that don't want to go out, don't want to see people, don't want to do this, don't want to, it becomes a it becomes a habit to get into, you know. And then you you just you know you're in this negative space. In the fitness community, in the fitness world, and everything, it's not all fucking rainbows and sunshines. Of course, it's not. But it's a it's a more it's a more positive area to be in. You know, you're trying to better yourself. You know, because physical exercise can be hard it can be difficult. There's no two ways about it. You know, there's, there's levels to it and it, you can keep going, but the be best thing about it is the progress. And then the people around you, the 
people around you that will see that. One of the best feelings you can ever get is is not seeing someone for two months and you've been smashing it in the gym. They go, fucking hell, mate, you're looking good, and you? I, you know, you was a bit of a f- fucking late couple of months ago and, and you're doing well now. And, you know, and you do, you think, oh, uh, you know, because sometimes you don't feel it yourself. You don't feel it yourself and you, you do need like validation from other people and people will sit there and go, no, you don't. Well, everyone does. Everyone likes a compliment. It's nothing bad bad about that, you know? But the the community you can build in a gym or at CrossFit, High Rocks, Running Club, all these different types of things, you know, especially especially if you're moving to a new area or you're lonely or you just, you don't, you don't feel like you've got enough friends. As an adult, you do... You do have transitional periods in life. You move jobs or you lose friends because you have different interests. You have all sorts of different things. So sometimes as you get into these communities, you you find the people that you actually want to be around. That's, you know, because they have the same interests as you. Yeah, Yeah, it's very true. It's funny you you said about like, like like-minded people and being in the gym. I remember when I started as a PT Mm -hmm. and then when I went on to sort of be a sort of fitness manager and support other PTs to, to get clients. And there was always like an, an approach anxiety uh, where people wouldn't want to go up to people in the gym and start a conversation and they never knew what to say. And I was like, guys, you're in a gym, like just ask them how the training's going. Like there's always an icebreaker. There's like a, by default, there's an icebreaker in a gym almost because you just have your training going, what you're training and that and that's it. That's it. Yeah. And, and I think you also mentioned there about um, sort of, I guess, finding the right level. And I think that's really important as well for people. It's just, finding that right entry point and we kind of touched on it already a little bit but you know we, we talk about the gym a little bit because we're you know we, we kind of are, are used to that environment and we we work as coaches and pt so we're used to being around the gym space but you know for my parents maybe for your parents they've never been in the gym they're never going to go in a gym yeah. so i think sometimes it's again it's about committing to sort of just movements and you can kind of talk about goals a little bit with this as well, because you've got obviously different types of goals, right? So you've got your, you know, almost like your behavioral goals and your outcome goals. And then you've got your sort of short, medium and long-term goals. And then we like the acronym in, in, in fitness, which is SMART, which is making it specific, measurable, achievable, realistic and time-framed. So for some people, and you've probably had this as a, as a VI, as a PT, someone who's barely done any exercise in their whole life will come up to me and go, right, I want to run a marathon. And it's like, amazing, like absolutely, that's, that's, that's aim for the stars, why not, let's get there. But, you know, have you even walked like quarter of a mile in the last year? No, you haven't, okay, fine. So that's not like destroy your dream. That's- That's gonna be on. a good time frame to do it. Yeah, but that's <laughs> a long-term goal, right? That's, that's, you know, let's park that over here. So what we now need to do is think about maybe some short and medium-term goals. So it might be that where I start with a 5K, you know, that start with a 10K, a half marathon, and then you get to your marathon. But even the 5K is unachievable for this person right now. But you've got an outcome. So we want to get them to 5K. That's an outcome. So how do we get there? Well, you start building behaviors, and we touched on this already. But we say, right, well, first of all, we're just going to get you moving a bit. So every day, let's commit to a 30-minute walk. Mm. And you start there, and that's that's a behavior. And what happens is when people start achieving that behavior – Again, they start feeling a bit fair, a bit healthier. They start working towards the outcome. They start getting motivated. They stick to that. And then you start adding in other behaviors. And often if you can, again, going back to the commute thing, if you're able to build like a behavior or a habit around an existing habit or behavior, it's so much easier to to adhere to as well. So if you say to someone, you know, if you're dropping the kids off, like while you're out of the house doing that, like when you get home, park a couple of streets over and walk back or whatever. And then you start building up those behaviors and over a long enough time frame, those those behaviors will compound and eventually lead to your outcome. And I think that's really important for people to understand as well. It's it's not about jumping in at the deep end, especially as we get on in life because, you know, we ain't 20 anymore, you know, and if you haven't been very active, the last thing you want to do is go really hard you know, that's when you could have a bad workout, which is rare. But if you go really hard and, and, you know, put yourself on your bum and the next day you've got doms for a week, it's enough to just take the wind out of someone's sails. Yeah, and they don't go back. No. So you need to find the right entry point um, and then sort of build up from there. And again, behaviors lead to outcomes. Yeah. And I think that's so important. The uh, One of the things I was chatting with my client this morning, it was, um, I do like a soft entry for people a lot of the time when they first start. So, 
check our diet out, what they're having, give them a few workouts, nice and light, get in, we see where we're at. And he's been doing well a couple of months. And, um, you know, he's lost a little bit of weight and we've just given some adjustments on his diet, nothing major. And then he's he basically he's come to me now and I said to him, like, are you ready to, like, step this up a little bit now? And he was like, what do you mean? I was like, well, I can give you a bit more of, like, a structured plan and, you know, you can we can probably get a little bit more weight off you and we can do this and that. And um, at that point, I feel like now he's ready. Mm. Whereas I find a lot of people, they they jump in two, two feet fast and they're like, right, I want to <laughs> I want to diet really heavily. I want to do as much cardio exercise as I can. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. And then it lasts for probably a week, maybe two weeks. And then that's just, yeah, they, they mess up on their diet. As soon as they mess up on their diet, that becomes, you know, they mess up on a Saturday night, they have a takeaway. Then Sunday, it's just out the window. And then they they then they stop coming to the gym and then it's just that cycle all over again. I failed. And what I genuinely believe that everyone should do is not, not go crazy. Just make adjustments to what they're doing. Like, you know, and it's the same with, you know, that, that motivation comes because of the adjustments that you can make just small adjustments all the time, all the time. Now, you know, get what I always say to my clients as well is get those, um, get those, those meals that you find really easy to, to have. So if you're every morning, if you like a certain breakfast, that's fairly healthy, wheat, a I don't know, shreddies, whatever, and you like it and you can control the calories on it to have that every day. If you, if you really enjoy it, whatever. And then for dinner, for lunch, like don't have so much of a varied lunch. Try and control again. If you like, even if it's like a, a sandwich, a certain sandwich or a roll or a, I don't know, something that's fairly like easy and manageable that you can have and just get into the habit of eating that regularly because I just want them to get into habits early. Mm. Habits of like good habits instead of like missing meals mm. and then coming home, starving, five o'clock, binging, because that's what happens a lot. People go, I'm too busy to eat during the day. I'm too busy to do this. I'm too busy to do that. They get to five o'clock and they're like, where, where's the, where's the cookies? Yeah. Where's, where's the crap? Where's the rubbish food? And then they ruin everything they've worked hard for. So those sort of like disciplines. Yeah. Is and what I, I try and get them into. It's a small wins as well, isn't it? Because I think, you know, you talk, you mentioned failure then and, you know, it's it's this it's this all or nothing mindset, which yeah. is a really unhelpful thinking pattern. But it's, it's so common. It's, it's a so journey, common. isn't it? And I think what you tend to see a lot is, you know, people and I've done this as well, where people like they'll they'll be doing great, but they'll make one mistake, and then they're like, "Well, fuck it." You know, <laughs> yeah. like, oh, I'm out. And yeah. mate, it's like well, if if you're if you're if you're driving and yeah. you scrape your bumper, you're not going to oh, fucking slam your car into a wall, are you? It's like it's it's that sort of mentality. And, and I've done that, by the way. Well, like, slam your car into a wall. No, well, <laughs> scrape your bumper. You definitely scrape your bumper. Yeah, I'll scrape my bumper. <laughs> but no, I, I have, I, I realised that I had those traits. Yeah, I hundred percent really had those common. traits in my twenties. Really common, mate. Hundred percent had those traits yeah. where I would be like, right, I'm going to diet, yeah. I'm going to diet hard, and then I would get two weeks in, and I would mess up once. It would be, it would be something stupid, and I'd mess up once, and I'd be like, right. And I, t- I tell you what, yesterday was a prime example is where I would have messed up before and I haven't now. Because yesterday, we, me and Paul went out for some food and we had a guest and it was a really nice day. And we had a big meal and it was quite a healthy meal. It wasn't too bad, but it was like- Big. Big meal, wasn't it? It was like a, a, the chicken was huge, you know, and whatever. But it wasn't on plan for what we've, what we've been doing. So normally though, the old, old Danny would have thought, well, I've messed up my diet now messed up my diet I've had this big meal I would have went home and I would have had another shit meal mm-hmm. I would have 100% in my 20s I would have I would have used that as an excuse then to eat back poorly but what I done yesterday is I it seems a bit weird. I just didn't eat just didn't eat the rest of the day and again it's whether it's right or wrong but I felt like I probably ate about 1500 calories in that one sitting yeah it was more protein than I was eating you know and it for me it was just like I wasn't sure how much more calories I had because it wasn't a, a, a tracked meal and then I just thought, right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, you know, I'm just gonna fast till tomorrow, and then get back on track this morning. Bang, back on plan. And again, you don't have to be that rigid with it. Of course, you don't. But it's that, it's that failure, and then being like, fuck it, like yeah. you said. And and this is it. I mean, obviously, you know, we're, we're primarily talking about physical activity and its benefit on mental health, and you know that that and nutrition often will go together. And and sometimes if people mess up on the nutrition, they they they, they you know they throw out 
you know, they throw out the, the exercise with the nutrition bath water as well. But then that falls onto their mental health, doesn't it? Yeah. Because then they're like that failure again, they feel, yeah. and then that is when it all falls apart. Yeah. And it, in a lot of the time it is through that food and then that, that spiral, of yeah, just yeah. that bad mental state then. And then it's like, I, th- <laughs> I failed again. I failed again. I failed again. The amount of clients I've had over the years that go, I've tried every diet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I tried every diet. I've tried Cambridge. I tried this. I tried that. And I'm like, you know, and I've failed. This is the word they use. I failed on them. And I'm like, it's not, it's not a failure. It's just that wasn't right. Yeah. You know, you've got to find what's right for you. Yeah. And it is different for everyone. Different hours they work and different things they do. Mm. And, you know, different mindsets and mental strength and discipline and willingness and all those things. It's all different for everyone. But you need to find that what is right for you yeah yeah and i think again that goes back to exercise as well so find the right entry point start walking commit to small regular movements Mm -hmm. obviously hire some experts and professionals if you so Mm -hmm. wish but i think that's the key message is that just find the right entry point start with something and just try and do more today than you did yesterday we go for a walk let's go let's go